When people ask me how my spring break trip to Israel and Palestine was, I never know where to start. It's partly why I decided to document the trip using black and white film photography. Black and white because it allows me to focus on the content of the scene and create timeless photos. And film because I get 36 shots per roll. That's it. It forces me to capture the most important moments. I spent weeks in the dark room developing photos, each one taking up to a couple of hours to get done. I could have easily just stuck to digital photos and have gotten instant results, but spending all that time in the dark room gave me the time and space to reflect on the trip. So, I think I'll start at the beginning of our trip in Jerusalem, one of the holiest cities in the world. Our introduction to the Holy Land was through a dual narrative tour in Jerusalem. We sat in the small courtyard in the shade of the Tower of David Museum, listening to Shukri, our Muslim Palestinian tour guide, who gave us the Palestinian narrative, while Itzhak, our Jewish Israeli tour guide, gave us the Jewish Israeli one. It was an intense discussion. Even a pigeon decided to listen in. Jews came over here as, as refugees back then. Then the Zionist movement came and they said, well, God gave us the land. So screw everyone who lives here. We own it. It's written in the Bible. Listen to Shukri as he uses the metaphor of a house, a house in which Israelis have come and banished the Palestinians to the basement. I'm gonna give you the basement. Then you would say, you know, the, the, the basement, the basement is, is too big. I want to scatter the basement and I'm going to give you permission every now and then to go up, look from the beautiful balcony and come back to the bathroom where you belong. This is, in my opinion, the story of Israel and Palestine. Listen to how Itzhak counters this metaphor. If you look behind you, okay, you will see uh, one of the towers the Herod built 2,000 years ago, which means over here it was a Jewish land. And we didn't like, you know, left Israel, we didn't like, you know, forced to live Jerusalem. And when asked what constitutes a homeland, it like cites the evidence of archaeological Jewish remains again. First of all, okay, what's meant, like, you know, our place, Israel, a homeland, is our history. Okay? When you go all over Israel, you will see that you know, Israeli Jewish archaeological sites, not just not from David's time, but even like you know, father of the sixth like, you know, century. He, he said he said archaeology. Archaeology, my friend, archaeology. This this is a perfect example of we are in an open air mosque, okay? And um, there's layers of archaeology. Part of it is, is Jewish, part of it is Muslim. So arche archaeological evidence does not. Um, but not say that this country belongs to, to some to some nation. Uh, what 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 is a country for me? What what is a nation? A place that I have memories, and I have uh, and I have ancestors, recent ancestors. I, I I can say. It was interesting to watch the two tell their stories, each holding their own binder of evidence, maps and pictures, and the reactions they held to each other's claims. I was excited to see the Dead Sea listed in our itinerary, but was disappointed when our bus stopped just two kilometers from the shore at a worn down salt plant. But this salt plant held an important story, one that was a reminder that even the Dead Sea is tied up with the politics of the region. This is the only Palestinian factory operating on the shores of the Dead Sea here. As per the Oslo Accords, this factory is in Area C, under complete Israeli control. The Palestinians that own the salt plant are prohibited from building or upgrading their facilities for over 50 years, explaining its overall worn-down look. The factory is close to an Israeli military installation, subjecting the factory's workers and premises to random searches. Israeli restrictions kept the factory from being connected to the electricity grid until 2010. It's a reminder of the limited Palestinian economic activity granted under Israeli law. While the landscape was vast and serene, it felt suffocated and stuck in time through the decaying infrastructure. We drove just north of the Dead Sea 
up a rocky mountain to another Palestinian-owned business in Taiba, aptly named Taiba Brewery Company, the first microbrewery in the Middle East. Our hardened Palestinian bus driver, Bassam, cool as a cucumber, drove up twisting roads, squeezing past trucks. We were greeted by a boy on a trotting horse as we entered the village. We met the daughter of the founding owners of Taiba Brewery, Madiz, one of the only female brewers in the Middle East. She explained to us how hard it is for them to export Palestinian beer under Israeli law. The day before on Palestinian trucks, it goes to the commercial checkpoint, um, 6 o'clock in the morning the next day. We have another tr Israeli truck on the other side of the checkpoint, has to go through paperwork and everything. They unload the first truck and then load the second truck. Now, if they finish before 12 or 2, they make it to the warehouse at the port. But if they don't, they have to leave the beer overnight, pick it up the next morning, and then take it to the port. Once it gets to the port, because it's a Palestinian com uh, product, it goes through security check again, which you pay for again. And then it's stored in a different warehouse because it's a Palestinian product, away from Israeli products. So once the beer leaves the brewery, we have no control over how long it sits under the sun, how they handle the pallets. If they break one bottle of beer in that pallet, by the time it reaches the customer, it's all moldy and nasty and stinky, and it doesn't, it's not the image of Taiba. Listen to how she describes a bottle of their exported beer. There's a story behind every single bottle. It's not just the Palestinian people that suffer from the occupation. You know, that bottle of beer suffered to get to your hands. She finishes by asking us a small favor. That's why when you guys go to any restaurant or bar or whatever, ask for taiba everywhere you go. <laughs> Even if you don't find it, you create the buzz, you know, and that's how you guys help us grow. This was a food trip after all, and it was in the quiet village of Sebastia, where we had the lunch of a lifetime. Chef Fadi Katan taught us one of the most iconic Palestinian dishes, musakhan. You don't reach in and grab those two. <laughs> She's challenging me. <laughs> <laughs> it's made of layers of taboon bread, onions, sumac, pine nuts, and topped off with roasted chicken. And for dessert, the world's best kanafe. And for me, my first. I'm not very good at math, so some of you may end up with two pieces, some with three pieces. I want three pieces. Whoever's been cheated. Sebastia is a history-laden village littered with archaeological ruins spanning back to the ancient Romans and the Greeks. Early Christians believed it to be the burial place of John the Baptist and where Salome performed the dance of seven veils. It was the first time during this trip where I saw a giant Palestinian flag waving proudly. This area is under mixed control. Most of the archaeological ruins are in Area C, under direct Israeli control. Yet Israel is doing nothing to protect the ruins. Nothing is labeled or roped off. We met a local, Abu Yasser, owner of a guest house in Sebastia, who became a farmer wanting to escape the politics. Yet he couldn't, when his fields of apricot and olive trees were razed to the ground by settlers, or when an Israeli sewage plant released their toxic waste onto his fields. How do you respond to a story like that? I could only nod and give him my full attention. He started listening to one of his favorite bands, The Scorpions. The music gave him, just for a moment, some peace. Yasser recounted a time where Sebastia was the number one tourist site in the region until Israeli occupation in 1967. It was a reality difficult to imagine as we were the only tourists there. During our last days of the trip, we visited Belgenjera, a small Ethiopian restaurant in Tel Aviv. The star of the lunch was a set of eight stews atop a sweet and tangy bread, injera. The owner is Fanta, whose family made the Aliyah from Ethiopia alongside thousands of other Ethiopian Jews, reflecting one of the oldest yet unknown diasporic Jewish communities outside of the Western world. Of course, she wouldn't let us go without teaching us a few Ethiopian moves. It's called Your, your 
This is always my favorite part. It's like magic. This has to be one of my favorite pictures. It's alive with the people I spent 11 days with. Our Palestinian chef slash guide, Fadi, with his big expressive gestures. Alon rushing to join the group. Naveen, our professor turned worrisome mom, taking a picture of her stand-in kids she found herself in charge of during the trip. All this buzzing life and dynamic personalities, just two kilometers from the Dead Sea, framed by a rusted piece of a Palestinian ladder, a reminder of one of the many narratives that characterize this land. So, when people ask me how my spring break trip was, I think I'll start with this picture. Come on, come on, okay.